So as Jill mentioned, um, title of our talk tonight or my talk is using assessments to drive literacy instruction. And I am a certified academic language therapist. Um, actually that came up in one of the questions that you asked uh, prior to this webinar. And what is that? It's, um, it's a, a certification that I did many years ago, actually in Texas and certified academic language therapists are really equivalent to Orton Gillingham uh, Associates. We spend a lot of time learning about the science of reading and most importantly, applying it in mostly working with kids with dyslexia and other reading disabilities. And so I, that is my background. I am also the president of Let Literacy How. I started the organization after I worked for 10 years at Haskins Labs in New Haven, where I was hired to apply the science of reading way back when in 2000, just after the National Reading Panel was released or the Reading Panel Report, I should say, was released. And I really prior to that worked with students who struggled with reading. And I shifted gears and started working with teachers and after working at Haskins, I founded Literacy How to continue the work that was funded by grants. We work in Connecticut, but thanks to COVID, and there aren't a lot of thanks to COVID really, but I try to look for silver linings in life. One of those is the fact that I've been able to work with other organizations around the country um, and outside of the country, including Ontario, and be able to do our good work beyond the Connecticut borders. What we do primarily with my team of, of 10 uh, or so mentors is we provide embedded support to teachers in their classrooms. We believe that the coaching support that we can give teachers actually helps them apply the science of reading, which can be very theoretical, conceptual, um, but what does it look like in the classroom? Teachers really want to see it in practice. So that's the work that we do. And I'm very blessed to be able to do that work with a phenomenal team. We empower teachers so that every child learns to read by third grade. These are our core values. And we firmly believe literacy is the key to opportunity. And we keep children at the center. We believe every child has a right to read. It is a civil right. And we know from research that 95% of all children can learn to read. And it's really the teacher that does that. It's not a program, it's not a product, but a teacher, a well-informed teacher, teacher ha who has lots of experience that really is the, is the key variable to teaching children to read, write, and spell. So we empower teachers with the best ways to teach. In this webinar, you're going to learn two things. One is you're gonna learn the objectives of a comprehensive literacy plan. And you're also gonna learn details about each of the types of assessment and the role that each one plays in the selection of appropriate and effective intervention. So this evening we're not gonna, or I'm not gonna talk a lot about interventions. Um, I will talk more about that in the summer course, but this evening I'm really going to provide a framework and a context and just fill your background knowledge um, in what is assessment, what is it all about? And I wanna preface those two objectives with this question. What is the big deal? Why is data so important? Well, first we know that we have to assess our students to determine risk. That is first and foremost. Um, but we also know the however is that we know that we over assess our students. There is no teacher that I or members of my team who've worked with who would say, oh, we don't assess kids enough. Not one. We know we over assess. Why? Because we have redundancy in assessments. If we looked at this one and this one, we'd say, oh, they're assessing a lot of the same things. We should not be over assessing. We should not have redundancies. We also know from the work that we do with our teachers is we don't support teachers in the process of, of data analysis, right? Of knowing how to analyze the data and most importantly, what to do with the data. 
And so at the end of the day, what I say is we don't have precious time to waste. We have to be spending most of our time and energy on the interventions we're giving our students that need us the most. So these are our four objectives of comprehensive reading assessment plan. And I'm gonna take each one in turn, really the first three, I'm not gonna to say too, too much about the last one, but the first objective is to identify students who are at risk for reading difficulties. Those assessments are referred to as universal screeners. The second is to identify the specific skills that explain why a student is struggling. And those we refer to as diagnostic assessments. The third is to determine a student's progress over time. Once we identify that they need support and that we have more diagnostic data to point to what that support should look like, we have to know pretty darn quick, quickly, what progress is being made. And if it isn't being made, we have to change course really quickly. And last but not least, we want to know overall, is the, are the assessments pointing to good outcomes? Are we seeing that the um, interventions that we're using are effective? So those are our outcome assessments. Now, I do want to say a couple words about assessment and response to intervention. So we have this term called RTI, response to intervention. I like to think of it as response to instruction because RTI includes tier one. And some people would say that's more instruction than intervention. I know that's kind of semantic difference, but semantics matter, terms matter. A core feature of RTI is identifying a measurement system. So tonight I'm gonna to be talking about our systems. What should a data system look like? We wanna screen large numbers of students. So we identify students immediately about what students need intervention. And then we have to monitor those students more frequently based on their need and level of intensity. It could be once a month, twice a month, um, or it could be every single week. And then we wanna think about administering diagnostic testing to be used for instructional planning. That's where you're going to get the most information about what, a, um, what interventions need to be put in place. This infographic is intended to clarify certain terms. As just said, semantics matter, terms matter. We could be saying RTI or MTSS, right? MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, is often used um, interchangeably with RTI. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're similar. But we want the big idea here is that we want our teachers, our parents, everyone who's involved in this process to have a common language. So this infographic, I think, does a nice job of explaining screening assessment that leads to diagnostic assessment and progress monitoring, two types of progress monitoring assessments. And then you see on the right hand side of this infographic, summative assessments. And I, as I said, I'm going to take each one in turn, but I thought this was a really nice infographic to show those four different types of assessments. Now I'm gonna start with universal screeners, screening, and universal screening is often referred to in medical terms as first alert, right? So if you go to the doctor and have an annual physical, or if you take your child to the pediatrician for their well baby or well child physicals, you know that those children will be screened, you will be screened to make sure that the doctor is paying attention to are you at risk for other problems? So this eye chart is an example of a screener, a first alert. The information that an, a universal screener will provide to teachers is that there are students who may not be making expected progress based on what we call benchmark goals. And those students, because they're not meeting those benchmark goals, they may need additional diagnostic assessments and small group individualized instruction. Now, in the context of a universal screener, you're often going to hear the term CBM or curriculum-based measure. Most of our universal screeners use this, um, this type of screening uh, technique 
as their, their go-to or the way that they're going to screen and measure progress. These um, refer to timed tests that evaluate accuracy or what we call ease of performance. A lot of people call this automaticity. So these are time tests because we want to see how quickly students can perform these tasks. These tasks and these tests give us accurate information about the level of performance, but also the rate of improvement. So again, CBMs are used for screening and for progress monitoring. Data from these assessments can be used and analyzed readily by teachers. And that's really important. These assessments are usually administered by teachers and must be used by teachers. So that means teachers need to be well-versed in the analysis of the data. Student goals and instructional programs can be um, adjusted in response to the analysis that we would expect teachers to be doing in response to the data that they're looking at. And the last part of CBM or curriculum-based measurement is that student data can be compared to local data, meaning classroom data, grade level data, school level data, and district level data. And that's an important concept because um, not, all not all assessments and, and progress monitoring assessments are CBM, and we'll talk more about that. So again, just to you know, recap a little bit, Bit on this. Screening measures provide information about a student's current level of knowledge and skills base. They're useful for determining the health of the student and identifying a starting point for instruction and planning grouping. Sometimes these screening measures result in a false positive, but rarely in false negatives, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. They're considered reliable and valid, and they have clear mastery targets, meaning they have well-defined benchmark goals. Examples of universal screeners include the DIBBLES, Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills, Predictive Assessment of Reading, also known as the PAR, and Ames Web. Now I want to tell a quick story. The stories are always helpful for building context. Um, back in 2011, so 10 years ago, a funder came to me um, because I had been working with the state of Connecticut and helping with policy decisions. And one major decision we had been considering was whether or not we should put in place a policy around universal screeners. The funder said to me, what do you think, we have, by the way, Connecticut has one of the largest achievement gaps in the United States. And this funder said, what, do you, what would you say is the most important thing that we could do and we could fund tomorrow to make a difference and help close the gap? And I said to her, to put a universal screener in place. Well, she didn't know that concept. She certainly knew the concept because we know from medical, um, medical uh, application, what I just talked about, first alerts, et cetera. She understood the concept, but she hadn't heard of it in the concept, in the context of education. And she said, well, what do, what do you currently use in the state of Connecticut? And I said, well, our assessment that every district administers is the DRA, the Developmental Reading Assessment. Some of you know that as it's a similar, similar to FAMTAS and Pinnell, uh, benchmark assessment system. So basically running records. And she said, is that a universal screener? And I said, no, it is not. What is a universal screener? So we had this conversation about universal screeners and why they're so important. Long story short, the foundation funded a pilot study where we had 15 schools, five schools, um, five, sorry, five districts across the state of Connecticut, mostly low income, low performing districts, three schools from each of those five districts. One was a control school, one was a treatment school that had a universal screener that they administered using a, um, a uh, technology uh, called Reading 3D. And then the third condition was a treatment uh, condition that also had a literacy how mentor to support the teacher's ability to use something they'd never used before. And what I want to, what I'm showing here is data from those three different cohorts of, of 
children. Um, so in the control schools, the kids actually went down on our state mastery test, the Connecticut mastery test. Um, so they actually decreased in scores in, from 2011 to 2012. In the treatment schools, the kids actually made progress on the CMT, which was great. And why did they make progress? We hypothesized that the teachers actually were looking at a different kind of data. They were looking at data that pointed to these foundational skills that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute that are really important to be paying attention to in K1, 2, and 3 for whether or not children be, will become proficient learning to read. Um, the next set of bars that you see here are kids that were in the treatment plus mentor condition. And these students outperformed, even though they started a lot lower, you can see the, the gap or not the gap, but the difference between these two bars um, is larger. So these students did statistically significantly better on our state mastery test. So assessment does matter. And in fact, even though these teachers um, and these students didn't have teachers who had a mentor to help them, by virtue of the fact that they were looking at this important information and data that they had never looked at before, um, their students improved. As a result of this study, we um, then put in place a policy that all districts in the state of Connecticut have to use a universal screener K through three. Now, um, I'm sure you have heard, or if you haven't, you probably um, should know about the um, Institute for Education Sciences. It's a division of the Department of Education in the United States, and they have wonderful practice guides. And this is a snapshot of one of them, assisting students struggling with reading, RTI and multi-tier intervention in the primary grades. And you see recommendation one on this practice guide is that all students should be screened for potential reading problems. And you can see, I'm not gonna read these, but you can see three things that should be happening in concert with those universal screeners. And I've lost my little cursor, there we go. Um, so a little bit more that I wanna highlight about universal screening and best practices. This is an infographic from the National Center on Improving Literacy. If you don't know about NCIL, um, you can Google it and you can find a tremendous amount of information for teachers, for parents, policymakers. This particular infographic talks about five things that we need to consider when we're putting in place a screening protocol. The first is thinking about classification accuracy which I alluded to a little bit earlier with false positives and false negatives. The second is when and how screening assessments will be administered. The third is who is going to be responsible for creating database. Fourth is making sure we have a data system, right? Um, grade level meetings so that we are looking at the data and we know what we're doing with it. And we have a really well articulated process for getting kids in and out of interventions. And last, the um, whole idea of communicating this information to families. That was a question, by the way, and I do wanna take one minute to thank you for submitting your questions. You asked phenomenally good questions. I wish I had the time this evening to answer all of them. I probably will answer just a couple at the end of this webinar, um, but I will tell you that these, these questions will inform the development of the course that I'm gonna be doing this summer. Um, one question in particular that made me think about this is how do we communicate the results of a universal screener and all data actually, all assessment results to families. Very important piece of this because often families and parents are the last to know about this and this information and they need to be well informed. Another infographic from NCIL is this one. As I mentioned, screening assessments need to be brief, easy to administer, valid and reliable, timely and informative. And then you see here, we mention, or this infographic mentions, some of the things that should be 
included in a screener for K1 and 2. And you can see phonological awareness, rapid automatized naming. Again, this is a great infographic. I'm not, I don't have time to go into detail on this, but take a look at this later and you can see the types of things that would be included in a screener for identifying risks. Now, um, we've been using Dibbles in schools around the, the country for many years. Dibbles is in its eighth edition now. And what I can say about the Dibbles, because many of our schools and districts use the Dibbles, is that um, they've actually improved it a great deal. So from the last edition to this, you can see in yellow what is new to Dibbles 8. Um, Maze has been used for a long time, but now Maze is given beyond sixth grade and to, through eighth grade. That's really important. So many middle school teachers say to me, we have no universal screeners to use with our students. Well, now you do. Um, oral reading fluency, again, is extended through eighth grade and is given the beginning of first grade. Word reading fluency is a new assessment that's added to Dibbles 8, and it starts in kindergarten as administered right through third grade. Nonsense word fluency has always been part of the Dibbles, but now it's administered early in kindergarten and then all the way up through third grade, phonemic segmentation fluency and letter naming fluency. Again, they've done a really nice job of expanding um, the assessment. The other thing I will tell you that is that the nonsense word fluency, which is a very important assessment that points to a student's ability to decode, used to just have closed syllables. Now the Dibbles eighth edition includes all the various syllable patterns. And that is not just a good screener, but also a good diagnostic assessment. So again, looking at classification accuracy when we talk about universal screeners is important. And I love this infographic because it talks about classification accuracy like a, tra a transportation security administration airport line. And again, in the interest of time, I won't read all of these. We want true positives, as many of those as we can, not as many false positives, because we know that when we have false positives, we may put a lot of um, energy and, and time and resources behind kids that end up not being uh, at risk. Um, and we want the true negatives, right? And not so many false negatives. Now, another great resource that I wanna point you to is the National Center on Intensive Intervention. NCII has a plethora of information about everything under the sun, academic behavior, screening, progress monitoring, they have modules, they have just a wealth of information, but I'm, took a screenshot of their screening tools chart because if you are uh, a teacher or administrator or even a parent from a district that doesn't have a universal screener in place, you can take a look at this website and this tools chart to see what your options might be. And you can see that they've actually taken very close look at the evidence behind the efficacy of these tools. Before I leave the topic of universal screeners, I just want to point out that the Dibbles 8 actually uh, not only is it enhanced in, in ways of adding grade levels and more information about kids' uh, ability to decode, et cetera, it also is looking more closely at how it can be used as a screening tool for dyslexia, as well as a progress monitoring tool to follow the development of students once they're in intervention. Many of the Dibbles subtests have been validated as measures for screening dyslex for dyslexia, including letter naming fluency, phonemic segmentation fluency, nonsense word fluency, and word reading fluency and oral reading fluency. And there's actually a great paper I can, um, point you to that at some point or send it to Jill and Jill can disseminate it. But there's a good white paper that has been written on the use of Dibbles for screening for dyslexia. 
If we think about the assessments, and I talked about the objectives and the four different types of assessments, we can also categorize these assessments as being diagnostic. In other words, before we even start our intervention, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the student? They can be considered formative. What are we doing during the assessments to make sure the assessment is actually capturing the learning and the student is making progress. And then the third aspect of these assessments is um, the summative. Once the interventions are done, what is the assessment of learning? How can we evaluate the efficacy of our instruction overall, the various tiers, and especially the efficacy of the interventions themselves? Now, the second uh, type of assessment I wanna speak about this evening um, are those diagnostic assessments where we're taking a closer look at what is actually happening? Why is the student at risk? What are the strengths and weaknesses? What I call the digging deeper assessments because curriculum-based measures are designed in the hope of me measuring what has actually been taught and seeing how the student is faring relative to his or her peers but they don't tell us everything we need to know, especially when students are at risk. Why are they at risk, right? We know they are, but we need to know why. So diagnostic assessments tell us why the student is struggling, and then they will provide specific information on the skills that the student may or may not have mastered along the way. They help us understand student performance in authentic context, especially to inform our instruction and intervention. And they provide information to practitioners, teachers, reading intervention and special ed teachers about strengths and weaknesses. And in fact, these assessments are usually most closely aligned with the instruction that students are receiving. Another great website, well, I talked about the National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, this is uh, a, another infographic, if you will, that looks at data-based individualization. This is that process that I mentioned that's sort of at the heart of response to intervention. And I'm just gonna call out here where diagnostic intervention or assessments come into play after we've done our validated intervention program. We want to look deeper at the diagnostic assessments. Is the intervention working? We're progress monitoring. Non-responsive, we go back to learn more. Responsive, we just continue to monitor progress. Another uh, tool that I'm going to share with you is this diagnostic decision tree. I wrote about this in a perspectives article that I wrote in 2017 called How RTI Supports Early Identification of Students with Different Reading Profiles. And in it, I talked about three different reading profiles based on word recognition skills versus language comprehension skills. And so I'm not, again, in the interest time of interest of time going to be able to talk specifically about this, but you know how decision trees work, right? If reading comprehension is at grade level, then we're gonna work on grade level curriculum. However, if reading comprehension is low and we don't know why it's low, we have to dig deeper. We have to decide you know, what's going on. And the first thing you would check is reading fluency. If that's on grade level, you're gonna work on vocabulary and comprehension. If it's not, we're gonna check word recognition, et cetera. So this is that whole idea of digging deeper. We don't wanna give every student every assessment. That's not necessary. If we, if we get an answer here, we can stop here. If we need to know more, we go deeper, 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 and then make a referral to special education. The one thing I will tell you is that we don't necessarily have to go through all of this to get here. If we believe that the student is in fact um, a student that should be identified with special, you know, with um, dyslexia or another reading disability. So don't have to get to the bottom, just like with RTI response to intervention, we shouldn't use it as a wait to fail model. We should absolutely know right away if the student needs to be referred and be given more uh, explicit and diagnostic assessment data to find out what's going on. Now, 
I'm not going to speak too much about this tonight, but I do want to put, I did include it here because in the summer course, I am going to talk about the cognitive model of reading assessment. Um, McKenna and Stahl have written a great book um, with this model at the heart. And um, it is actually quite helpful for again, streamlining the process of figuring out what's driving the reading comprehension problem. Is it a problem with automatic word recognition? We have to assess these things. Is it a problem with language comprehension? We have to assess these things. Is it a problem with applying strategies when we're reading, purposes for reading, et cetera, being metacognitive, then we have to look at these three things. So I will be talking more in, in greater detail about this when I present this course this summer. Now, the third uh, area of assessment that I wanna talk about this evening is what we call progress monitoring. And progress monitoring is extremely important once students are identified at risk. We need to make sure that they're responding to the intervention that we're applying. And so again, looking at this IES practice guide, recommendation four talks about monitoring the progress of tier two students at least once a month and using those data to determine whether students still require intervention. And if students aren't making adequate progress, moving them into a tier three or special education intervention. And so that I just want to again, point you to this practice guide because it really does have the research behind us as far as explaining what we should be doing with assessments. Think of growth charts. So when you're progress monitoring, if you have a young child or you had a young child that you brought to the, to the pediatrician and the first thing they did each well baby visit from the time they were born up through their first birthday was to measure their height and their weight to make sure they were growing properly. And if they weren't, they would intervene with um, more testing, more diagnostic assessments. They weren't going to wait too long to figure out what was going on. Um, progress monitoring assessments include inter interim assessments and formative assessments. And that's something that was included in that infographic that I showed you from the National Center on Improving Literacy. Um, interim assessments, again, as the name suggests, are progress monitoring assessments that you're gonna administer along the way to make sure that you're tweaking your intervention according to how the student is performing on these. Formative, formative assessments you are administering after a longer period of time. All in all, these assessments determine progress over time as compared to what we call a validated trajectory. So we're looking at trend lines um, and we're looking at an aim line and goal lines to make sure students are making, making adequate progress so they will close that achievement gap. This helps us plan differentiated instruction. When we think about progress monitoring assessments, we're thinking about formative assessments as I measured. And we can think about these in two ways. We can think about formative assessments as mastery measure, measurement assessments or general outcome measures. So I wanna compare the two and talk about this for just a moment. Mastery measurement is um, really specific to the specific skills that you're teaching the students and the program that they're using to teach those assessments. Um, in, the, in the United States, we use the Wilson reading system a lot for kids who have difficulty with word recognition. And so there's a scope and sequence that we follow and we use these mastery tests, um, otherwise known as criterion reference tests to see if students are mastering these skills. These data help assist in making changes to accelerate or slow down um, and reteach. There, these tools do have reliability and validity based into them. However, they don't reflect generalization. So we need two types of formative assessments to make sure that the students are mastering the skills, but that they also can generalize these 
when they're reading and writing anything. So the general outcome measures, the GOM scores reflect competence in a year long curriculum. They describe growth over time. They're program and curriculum independent where mastery measures are dependent on the program that you're using to teach these skills. These general outcome measures will work across program, programs and they're used for designing and evaluating interventions but they don't measure mastery of skills, which is why I wanna to point to the fact that you really need both for progress monitoring. We are asking this question, right? As we look at student data, how does my student's performance compare to both grade and or age level expectations? And again, comparing a norm reference test that's standardized where you're performing the student's um, skills and data against a population of students that child's age or grade. Um, think about a growth chart, as I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the more common assessments we use as a norm reference test to do this is the WIAT, the Wexler, Intel, um, Wexler Individualized Assessment Test, uh, Achievement Test, sorry. Um, and these use uh, performance data on specific test items, but they only sample of the skills. So you may only have one item per skill as opposed to a criterion's reference test. Criterion reference tests are those mastery tests that I just spoke about. So we're perform you're looking at performance compared against a set criterion. And think of these as like taking the temperature, a body temperature, uh, an educational assessment that we use that's a criterion reference test is the Gallistel Ellis test of coding. Um, the way the Wilson assessment of decoding and encoding is another example of a criterion reference test. So again, I wanna just highlight the difference in the types of formative assessments that we use. Again, as I mentioned, a criterion reference test, they're very important. They look at mastery, what concepts and skills have the students mastered. In order to have a criterion reference test, you kind of have to have a scope and sequence of what you're teaching along the way to have as your criteria. Um, they provide diagnostic information, which is extremely important. Um, and a pass-fail score or percentage, 20%, 40, 80, whatever you set as your criteria for mastery is used versus the standard scores that you see in a, um, in a norm reference test. And one of the questions that was asked um, from somebody in the group, somebody in the audience with the pre-questions was about spelling assessment. And I, and I love spelling assessments as a type of criterion reference test. And I will talk more about spelling tests. They're wonderful for lots of reasons. They're great for progress monitoring. They're great for giving us diagnostic data as this slide shows. And I'll talk more about those, uh, not this evening, but uh, in the summer. So stay tuned for that. Now, the last type of assessment that I wanna talk about this evening is um, what I call outcome assessments. So I have a little you know, target here because what are these assessments? Really, they're, what are they about? Did we reach our goals? And I mentioned earlier, we have these summative assessments that are used to evaluate the effectiveness of a program usually administered at the end of an academic year to look at the achievement of our, our goals as a school, as a district. Um, does it show that our curriculum is on par or not? Um, and our students, are, are they placed in the programs according to the data and are the data pointing to success? These assessments are aligned to a set of content standards. An example of a summative assessment or an outcome assessment are final exams, right? Could be considered a summative assessment in terms of normed tests, um, more high stakes tests. We think of our statewide or national assessments. In the United States, we have um, the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. 
that's administered to a sample of students every other year. Many of you are probably familiar with those. Those are, um, that assessment is called the nation's report card because we can actually compare, every state can compare itself against other states. Um, we also have the assessments that are mapped onto the common core state standards, the SBAC and the PARC are, are examples of those. And then you could consider that the SAT and the ACT are also summative assessments because they point to what a student has learned. What I will say about assessments, summative assessments, is that they're not going, they're not uh, going to be used to drive instruction. Okay, and that's really important for you to think about because by the time we look at those assessments, the data from those assessments, it's old data. Any assessment that's gonna be used to drive instruction, it should be as current um, as possible. And I'm gonna talk more about that in just a moment. So now that I've described the four types of assessment, I wanna take um, a little bit of time to talk about using student achievement data to support instructional decision-making. Again, this comes from a practice guide. This was recommendation five. If you have all this data and you're not using it to make decisions, if you don't have a data system that supports the efficient use of the data, then I hate to say this, but you're wasting your time and your students' time. So we don't have time to waste, as I said at the beginning of this webinar. We have to have systems that make this work. And so the data system has to involve a variety of stakeholders, all the way from the top to the teacher who is really the one on the front lines in most cases, administering and, and analyzing the data. We also have to clearly articulate the requirements for a data system and determining whether to build or buy one and then planning an implementation process for adopting that system. And so that's beyond the scope of tonight's webinar, but I will talk for a couple of minutes before I wanna leave a little bit of time for Q&A, and I'm glad to see that I think I will have time for that, is to just talk for a few minutes about graphing our curriculum-based measure scores, because the graphs really allow teachers to quantify rate of improvement and increasing scores will indicate responsiveness. If the scores are flat or if they go down, that means they're not responding. And as I said to you all at the beginning of this webinar, RTI is, is the, at the heart of all of this. So I've pointed you here to three different websites. They're both great, Easy CBM, CBM Now, and Intervention Central. They all have really good tools for looking at data and graphing data. And again, you know, it's all about making this as easy as possible. Graphs allow teachers, as I said, to um, quantify the rate of improvement. I think this is a redundant slide. Um, so I'm gonna breeze through that one. The data management, um, another great resource for looking at data management is this IRIS um, Peabody. And this actually has a graphing tool. And on this, particular on this website and at this link, you'll see the data management program and graphing tool where it talks about setting up a database, developing the procedures for collecting, entering and sharing data, and then training staff on the data collection and the management procedures. Now, this is just a screenshot of the IRIS graphing tool. So when you go to that link that I just shared with you, you're going to see something that looks like this. There is a PDF that explains how the graphing tool works. And what is really cool about this tool is that you have um, data on each of your students and you put in their performance on each of those progress monitoring probes. And then you click on this link and it immediately takes you to a graph that shows the progress of the student. And if you set your beginning um, you know, goal, benchmark goal, and your end of year or end of semester goal, you'll see how you're doing um, in terms of getting and making progress toward that goal. 
Um, I want to, you know, just leave you with this thought before I take questions. The best designed assessment with the most reliable and valid measures administered by the best trained assessor or assessors won't change a child's reading trajectory unless someone in the child's life does something different. So as much as I believe wholeheartedly that data is at the heart of all this work that, that we need to do on behalf of our students, particularly our students who are most at risk, we really have to think about once we have the data, what are we gonna do with it? And what is that going to point us to? How is it going to tell us what a student needs in terms of an intervention? And how are we going to know as quickly as possible if that intervention is working or not? So that is really super important. I have a screenshot here too, because if you don't know about the resources that are on the IDA Ontario website, um, it's wonderful. There's a lot of great information. This is just a screenshot, but if you click on documents and books, fact sheets, et cetera, you're going to go to links to a host of resources and wonderful information that I know you'll find very valuable. Um, I, before I take questions, I do want to take just a couple of minutes because I actually have time for this to first of all, thank you and um, really appreciate having the opportunity just to present to you this evening, but also to say, um, I'm gonna stop sharing now, is also just to talk for just a moment about some of the questions that came in pre-webinar. Um, one thing that was talked about was what are the assessments that align with the science of reading? And I really didn't spend too much time talking about the science of reading, right? But I know you all are familiar and have heard that it's such a buzzword or term. It's a hot button topic. Um, the science of reading is really that body of evidence that is has been accumulating for 40 to 50 years. It should be informing what we're doing for our students who are at risk. And your question, whoever asked it is such an important one because we wanna make sure that the assessments we're using are actually assessing those skills that are tied to you know, what we know from the science of reading our students need to master. So that was a great question. And again, I will be pointing you to many of those assessments during the summer course. Um, you also asked specifically about K-1 and interested in learning about literacy screeners for K-1. As I mentioned, the Dibbles 8, I think has done a nice job of adding more, but some of the other websites I pointed you to will also take you to some of those. Um, another great question that came up was the double deficit hypothesis. I didn't talk about that, but um, because again, I have a couple minutes and I did mention the RAN. The RAN is the rapid automatized naming. That is a very important um, assessment that is built into these timed tests because basically the idea is that automaticity is pointing to a student's ability to do something without thinking about it. Now, students who have slow processing speed in general have trouble doing things quickly. They might um, have trouble retrieving the names of things. So when we test them with a very quick 45 second to a minute task, how quickly can you name these letters? How quickly can you name these numbers? We know very quickly, do they have problems with rapid naming? And does that point to processing speed difficulty? And if it does, most likely that student is going to be slow at reading. And does that mean they can't comprehend? Does that mean they have an intellectual disability? Absolutely not. But it's very important information because it points to risk. And it's considered part of a double deficit when a child has trouble with processing speed as well as problems with phonemic awareness, being able to understand that words are comprised of these 
discrete sounds called phonemes. So again, because I had time to, to answer that question, um, I was happy to be able to mention that because it is something that's included in dyslexia screeners often. And I'll stop there because I know that there are probably other questions that folks might have. Great, great. Thank you so much, Margie. A You're very welcome. full hour of information. And um, certainly I think many of our viewers might be interested in the, in the workshop. So I actually will be just posting the link to the information about the workshop and the registration in the chat here in a second. Um, but it's a, basically a four half day workshop uh, in August 9th to 12th online. And um, people can find out more information on our website. So um, I think I'll, leave, I'll ask Alicia and Joanne to pose any questions there. I have some as well, but let's start with uh, what they have. Would you like Great. to start Alicia? I'll, sure, I'll jump in, thank you. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was about running records. So at the beginning, you had uh, briefly mentioned running records and uh, we had some questions about, so exactly what is the issue with running records? And just for context, that is pretty much the standard in Ontario at this point. Yeah, thanks for asking Alicia. And I'm, and I'm so glad you brought me back to that because I didn't spend too much time discussing that. But you know what, it's, I, I think it's the standard in many, many places, including the United States. I think every one of the districts that we work in, we still use running records, even though we have a mandate that they use universal screeners. And why is that? Because teachers actually, I think, are in the habit of administering running records and looking at those. And so is, you know, here's my thing with running records. I feel like it's good practice to listening to listen to a child read out loud. And so as a child is reading out loud to just see how they're doing, what are the errors that they're making, et cetera. No problem with that. It is not a screener because screeners have to be fast and they have to be looking at these discrete skills. And that's not what a running record does. A running record can be used as a diagnostic tool. But my problem with a running record is, and I can't speak for Ontario, I can only speak for my experience in the United States. Most teachers do not analyze their running records. They don't do that for two reasons. One is because it's extremely time consuming to do so. And two is because they don't necessarily know what they're looking at. So in most cases, they've been trained in the um, MSV, right? The three queuing systems. And honestly, they're confused when it comes to that. And we know from research, there is no evidence for the efficacy of analyzing meaning, syntax, visual errors. So um, I'm looking, if, if a student or a teacher wants to use a running record, I'm going to point them to the kinds of error patterns that are really more effective for diagnosing and prescribing what the most effective intervention should look like based on the errors that those, those students are making. I hope that makes sense. It's Thank a big you. question and a very important one. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gillis. Um, one question that's come up is, speaking of low RAM scores and slow processing speed, we have a participant who wants to know whether a child with that profile can be remediated in reading. Absolutely, yes. Yes, so do not lose heart. Um, I will say though that children who have a double deficit, meaning they have difficulty with phonemic awareness and naming uh, processing speed is slow, is that we're not gonna put pressure on them to read fast because they can't read fast. And it doesn't matter how fast you read. You have to read fast enough to make meaning and you have to understand that you may take longer. It may take longer for you to get the, the assignments done, but that doesn't mean that you're not smart. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, right? We're not gonna focus on speed. We're gonna focus on accuracy and we're gonna focus on giving uh, the students some tools for accommodating the fact that they read slowly focus on comprehension. There you go. Very yes, thank important. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Maybe I could just ask a question about 
Uh, it's a good one. Someone's asked is who is qualified to administer screenings and assessments? And I assume this would depend on the specific tool, but how does a teacher learn to do these assessments properly? And, uh, you know, we work our way down from a screener all the way to maybe a, those involved in a psych ed assessment, which requires psychologists. So maybe you could just go right. over. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's another ex really important question. Screeners, you know, Teachers would, would be qualified to administer screeners, but absolutely have to be trained properly. And I have to say that, you know, again, because Dibbles are most commonly used, Ames Web, CBMs, um, one of the assessments that's the trickiest to administer, well, two that are tricky are nonsense word fluency and phonemic segmentation fluency. So teachers have to themselves be able to know those sounds and hear those sounds. And if a student is reading quickly, it's hard to take, you know, make sure you're hearing them properly, that you're you know, that you're marking the protocol correctly. So they need training and they need to make sure there needs to be somebody who's watching them do it to make sure that their assessment data is reliable and valid. But teachers absolutely can be um, trained to do that. I will also say progress monitoring the same teachers trained to do that as well, as well as the diagnostic assessments. Now, the norm reference test, the achievement test, the, the comprehensive test of phonological processing, you don't have to be a psychologist to administer those. However, you do need to get training and make sure that you understand not only how to administer them, but even more importantly, how to analyze the data from those assessments. Mm. What is it? What does it mean? What are those yeah. results mean? I have to say, I think it is challenging to get that training, but I think there is more happening online now, which is really good to see for people who can't access training in a, in, you know, in person. Yeah, yeah. And actually on that note, Jill, one of the um, questions that someone asked was about um, distance learning and yes. how are, can you administer these yeah. assessments, which is yes. a really important question right now. And I will tell you that um, the answer is yes. It's a little harder. Um, certainly the phonemic segmentation tests are mm -hmm. harder. It's really hard to watch a child. You can't really see a child's mouth unless they have a clear mask on. Um, but if the child is at home and you're where you are and you don't have to worry about masks, as long as you are trained well to see what's happening. Um, what we have found is having an adult sitting next to the child. And that's tricky because the adult, you know, is sometimes um, tempted to tell the child, give the child the answers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have to be careful with that. But the answer is we have to figure out how to do these assessments um, based on the, the restrictions that we have that we know are just real. Um, what so. about some of the new computer-based screeners, such as uh, Nadine Gabs? Um, someone's mentioned the Apprise screener, which I'm not familiar with, but I've certainly heard of Dr. Gabs. Yeah, Dr. Gabs' um, early screener is is now out and in, in the public domain. The other one, Apprise, is uh, Famico Haved, and um, oh, okay, I didn't know the name. Yes, I yeah. knew she was working on one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and those are, as you say, computer adaptive. Um, they're not necessarily meant to be administered remotely, but um, they are done with a computer, with an iPad, actually, each of them. Um, and those, you know, those are really important. I, the, you know, we don't have enough data to know how exactly they're going to be utilized, but I think they have great promise as far as looking at um, early warning signs for four and five-year-olds who are at risk. Very excited about that work too. Yeah. Um, I do real quickly, I'm looking at the time and I know we're just a minute over, but I did have quite a few questions that came in about uh, assessing French. And um, one thing I will say about that is that we know that good practice is if a child is speaking English as a second language, you wanna know what their proficiency is in their first language, right? And, um, you know, both in terms of their oral language as well as the written language, can they read and write in that 
in French if that's their first language. But ultimately we will be administering the assessments in English because if that's the language of instruction, then we need to know, you know, again, how the student is doing and how their progress is advancing. Now that gets muddied if they're in dual language programs, I know, and it's more a labor intensive process because if they're expected to be reading and writing both languages, then we have to assess their um, skills in both languages. And so I'm not an expert in this, but um, I know that was an, an area that people were interested in understanding more about that. Great, do we have any more? We do, there's one lady, she's alone in her school in terms of, she's a reading specialist and also a classroom teacher, and there's no support in her school with the science of reading. And she'd like to know where could she begin? <laughs> oh boy, what, is the question with regard to assessment or is it question with regard to just learning about the science of reading? Uh, well, there's also someone Regarding assessment, someone was saying they only do DRA in their school, which is very common in Ontario, as we said. And she said, but she'd like to obtain the dibbles, uh, but, uh, and do it on her own. You know, this is what happens sometimes in Ontario. This, we have ladies who are gentlemen as well, teachers who are enthusiastic about the science of reading, structured literacy, the assessments, but they're alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard when you're alone. I mean, if yeah. you can somehow find one person and they may not be in your school, but they are some mm -hmm. an ally and somebody that you can mm -hmm. bounce ideas off and just talk about mm -hmm. what your challenges are. I think it helps to have um, another person to help you. Mm -hmm. But it, the wonderful mm -hmm. thing about these screeners is that a lot of them are free. So you can access the Dibbles. You can, I highly recommend that you look at Easy CBM. Um, Easy CBM is free. There's a free version called Light and there's a deluxe version that you pay for, but the Light version is free. Very easy to just get started with Easy CBM. Um, because then you just try out a couple of those assessments. And what you're going to find is, you know, like I said to you in that study that we did back in 2011, is that teachers never knew anything about these screeners. And once they started looking at the data and they were, they were it was powerful because they started teaching these skills, these discrete skills that they didn't, they knew they were important to reading, but they didn't know how they worked and how to teach them. And when they taught them, guess what happened? The kids learned them, voila. And it's very, very motivating when you see those scores move. Um, so I highly recommend that you try out. Don't try to take it all on at once, but do you know a little at a time. Thank you. And spelling, like I said earlier, spelling is a great assessment. The, you know, words their way inventories are so easy. You can give the entire assessment um, or not the entire assessment. You can give the assessment to your entire class. So it's not even something you have to do one-on-one -on -one. and it can be very diagnostic looking at spelling errors. I think we're running out of questions here or we've done a lot of them. I, I have one more about the any considerations about using norm-based tests that are normed in the U.S. and are there issues for Canadian um, norms? I'm like now a lot of the psych ed assessments are done, I think, with U.S. norm data like the WIAD and the WISC. Perhaps they have Canadian norms on those. I don't know, and you may not know that, but just uh, is it something we should be looking carefully at, or has there been some evidence that we don't, it's not a big con concern. You know, it's it's probably worth delving into. And I have to say, I, I don't know enough about it. I think yeah. the norm, norming data is important in looking at the demographics. Um, and when I say the demographics, uh, looking at the socioeconomic mm -hmm. status and also the English language status or, you know, um, as you know, in the United States, we have high percentages of students who speak languages other than English, um, both alphabetic and non-alphabetic. 
And so I would say that our norms are probably comparable in the sense that we have high percentages of children speaking other languages and the, the newest additions of those achievement tests reflect the changing demographics. Mm -hmm. So I believe they probably would be fine for Canada, but I can't say that firsthand. Yeah. I would want to ask somebody who has yeah. knowledge about that. The, yeah. The people the who have done the research on the, yeah. on the norming. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Could I another? ask one little thing? Yes. Go. Emily Moorhead has chimed in. She's one of our champions in Ontario where she was alone in a school and wanted to implement better reading practices in her own class, did her assessments on her own and targeted intervention in kindergarten and had such wonderful results from, it was like the law of attraction. Other people wanted to learn what she was doing. So this is another strategy is, you know, for her, she recommends do your own assessments, implement your own little practices and you'll see people will come. <laughs> so anyway, thanks, that. Emily. Sorry, That's yes. awesome. Law of attraction. I'm going to yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. Okay. I see one other comment here that the whisk and the Y do have Canadian norms. Oh, so great. There you go. Excellent. Okay. So Thank I'm you. not, I think it's an issue for maybe Dibbles. I'm not sure if it's a norm-based assessment or not, but I think this is the kind of thing you'll be diving deeper into the workshop. So we're going to leave people hanging with some unanswered questions and um, it does, you know, it's, it's going to take some time to, to really cover all this material properly. And that's why we've, uh, suggested that we do this in a four morning workshop in August. So I would just like to thank you, um, Margie, for a great, very in-depth, uh, quick cover uh, coverage of uh, assessment and a, a really good primer for the workshop that we are looking forward to seeing you in the summer.